We're moving on now to chapter 4, where we will cover modulation. I say and a little of chapter 9, as one of the modulation formats is covered in 9 instead of 4, and we'll be pulling that out and looking at it uh, together with the other modulations. So we'll start with motivation. Why are there so many modulation formats? And then we will step through definitions of some of the more important modulation formats. And when we address all these formats, the motivation is going to be how we can uh, make the trade-off between the three most important criteria for any communication system. So those, those criteria are, of course, the spectral efficiency for the same uh, information rate how compactly can we put that into the spectrum, frequency and spectrum. Then we'll look at what I call power efficiency, or the bit error rate versus signal to noise ratio uh, performance, so that if we have the same uh, energy per bit assigned to the modulation format, which one gets better bit error rate for that fixed energy per bit. And finally, there is the complexity or the cost of the system. And one of the reasons, uh, the main reason that so many modulation formats exist is so that we can move our trade-off from different sectors of these uh, three criteria. So there are two types of demodulation or two types of detection that we'll be looking at, and they will have a big impact on these three uh, criteria. And so they uh, are uh, a natural way to divide um, the systems that we'll be looking at. So the first time type is known as coherent detection, and then the opposite of that would be non-coherent detection. And what does coherent detection mean? It can mean different things in different contexts, so I want to make sure that uh, for this class it's very clear what the definition is that we're applying. And a coherent system is one where the phase of the carrier is known to the receiver. So in many communication systems, we're not using baseband. We're using a carrier frequency to shift all of the information contact to a higher frequency uh, band. And in this uh, conversion, there is what's known as a carrier. And that carrier has a certain phase. And this phase may be um, different at the oscillator at the transmitter than the phases for the same uh, oscillator at the uh, detector. And so this phase difference between them, if it is known, if it is known at the receiver, in that case we can do what is called coherent detection. If it is unknown, then we fall in the second category, non-coherent detection. So that is really uh, the main uh, definition, knowledge of the carrier phase. So if that is the case, then we will have a certain receiver which is optimal, and that would be the correlator. So uh, we have, in, in essence, uh, been looking at systems uh, um, with the correlator. We've seen that already. And these are going to be uh, the solution, in fact, for coherent detection. And in these cases with coherent detection, the noise is additive white Gaussian noise. Now, when we move to coherent detection, when the phase is unknown at the receiver, then the optimal receiver is going to be a receiver that, that detects power. And often this takes the form of an envelope detection. Now, although the receiver noise is additive white Gaussian noise, because we're detecting the power of the signal, in that case, it's like um, squaring the signal, and the noise becomes non-Gaussian due to the operation we're putting on it in the receiver. So two distinct characteristics. Very simple assumption. We either know the carrier phase or we don't. In the case where we know it, we're going to go on and do a correlator, and all of our analysis will be with Gaussian noise. When the carrier phase is unknown, that method will not work. It will give very poor results. And so when we do not have knowledge of the phase, then we're going to go into something more like power detection. And we can do the analysis then, but the analysis will be a little different because of the noise in this system would not be Gaussian. So one reason that these two systems exist is really because of the third criteria, complexity and cost. So right away, it's this knowledge of the phase of the carrier doesn't come for free. Knowledge of the phase of the carrier requires us to do a tracking loop in order to track uh, the carrier phase. And because of that added complexity, 
uh, we would naturally put the coherent detection as a more expensive solution than non-coherent detection. So we're going to be covering co both of these uh, in this chapter. So this gives you a rough idea of the sections that are uh, covered in the textbook. Um, so let's start with uh, a little uh, idea of how we're going to attack uh, the problems. First, there is binary case, and we've pretty much done this already. We looked at signal space, we understand that it required a good normalization, and we found that the distance between the two bits in signal space, the two vectors, uh, determined the probability of error, and, and we uh, looked at equations for that. Now, in the chapter four, we're going to want to generalize this to the MRE case. And in order to do this generalization, we'll be exploiting the signal space. And once again, it will be the distance between symbols which determines the performance of the system. So how do we generalize from just two bits where the distance between them is unambiguous? And when, what happens when we go to a higher number of symbols, uh, when the distance between symbols becomes, um, uh, there are more possibilities, how do we uh, address this? So these are the topics that we'll be covering in chapter four. So let's look back again at what we saw in chapter three for the binary case. We looked at Anoff keying and uh, binary facial keying. Uh, we called it uh, antipodal signaling, but we'll be seeing in this chapter another name for it, um, binary facial keying. So this is just a quick uh, review to you. Um, Anoff keying, you send nothing for the logical zero. You send some waveform for the logical one. This is the signal space representation with the correct normalization so that the average energy per bit is represented by the uh, quantity square root um, of energy, average energy per bit is given by EB. And the BPSK case is one signal waveform and it's the negative of that which is used for the logical zero. And the probability of error uh, which we derive from this representation in signal space. And when we plot the probability of error for these two systems, we get the classic bit error rate water fall curve with uh, the BPSK being the curve which is closest to the origin, so we know that's the better uh, performance. And if we looked at a given uh, value, 10 minus 5 or something, we would see it's about a 3 dB uh, difference between the two. So that was what we did for binary. Now let's go on and look at some uh, MARI uh, modulation formats. So I said I'd start with a little motivation. Why do we have different uh, modulation formats? I said it was to balance this um, trade-off, but there's also other reasons why we have many modulation formats. And one of them, uh, why do we have modulation at all? Why do we use um, carrier modulation in particular? Uh, when we use a carrier, we are shifting, as I mentioned earlier, we're shifting from baseband, where we would just um, send the, the waveform in, uh, you know, centered at, at low frequencies, and we're shifting it by multiplying by a carrier to put it into some other pass band. And that's a difference between Chapter 4 and Chapter 3. Chapter 3, we only addressed uh, baseband. In chapter four, right away, we'll assume that there's a carrier, and we'll see that our signal space analysis uh, covers this, which is uh, one of the uh, reasons that we introduce it. But again, why do we have this carrier modulation? Well, uh, there are many reasons, uh, two important reasons. One is because of, let's take uh, wireless, for example. If we want to uh, transmit uh, with gain, uh, we use an antenna. But the size of the antenna is inversely proportional to the carrier frequency, which means that the lower in frequency the content is, the larger the antenna has to be. And you don't want a massive antenna on the end of your cell phone. You want a very small stub antenna, uh, something even smaller that's integrated into your smartphone. And for that, that only works the small size if I move to higher frequencies. So very natural to put on a... Uh, a higher frequency, a carrier modulation. Uh, another reason is to do multiplexing. If we want to handle many uh, different uh, users simultaneously on the same, oh, let's say the same twisted pair for telephone um, uh, to the home, 
Uh, in that case, we can't have everybody talking in baseband because they would be on top of one another. So what we do is we allocate a frequency, for instance, to each home. So each home would have a different frequency. The voice band would be put on that one frequency. They'd all be stacked up, and, and we could distribute um, uh, many voice calls on a single uh, pair, twisted pair um, from the central office uh, by doing this, what we call frequency division multiple access, or FDMA. So these are the reasons why we have car carrier modulation, and also to do this, this um, balancing of the, the three criteria. Um, so as I said, what's great is that the sig signal space analysis that we introduced in Chapter 3 for baseband and for binary is actually also valid for carrier modulation, which is uh, why it's, it's well-loved. Um, the basis vectors, in essence, are going to take care of that uh, modulation, the carrier modulation. And often, we're going to see that there are two basis vectors which occur very frequently. And that would be the um, um, what we call the in-phase and quadrature. And that would be the uh, cosine of the carrier and the sine of the carrier. So you can see, of course, these are waveforms, a uh, sinusoid and a cosine, and a si sine and a cosine. And these are functions of time, and they are very valid basis vectors for signal space. And we'll see now, when, as I introduce different modulation formats using carrier modulation, uh, these will come up often as our, um, as our basis vectors. So let's start with PSK, which is known as phase shift keying. So we have here the mathematical expression for phase shift keying. So we have our waveform here, S of t. And S of t uses a cosine. Omega 0 here is the carrier frequency. So we have a tone at a certain frequency. And we add to the uh, argument of that cosine, we add a phi i of t. And this represents the data. So the data is in the phase offset. Hence, we call it phase shift keying. And we assume <clears throat> that this is the waveform during one symbol interval, interval. Therefore, from T to uh, capital T. So capital T here is the symbol time. Now, what does the, do these phase shifts, what, what values do they take? So typically what we'll see is we'll take the 2, two pi radian circle and we will divide it into m divisions where m, capital M, is the modulation order or the uh, number of symbols in the constellation, the number of symbols in the alphabet. And uh, the other um, variable that uh, we see here is the E for energy and it's the energy per symbol. We'll see that maybe I should be putting an S there so I don't get the bit and the symbol energy mixed up. But anyway, in, this, um, in these equations I'm presenting today and what's seen in the book, the E is energy uh, per symbol. So we have this cosine, the energy um, and time sort of uh, um, normalize this, this waveform. And all the information is here in the phase. So now here is an example where we would find the, uh, we could use the Gram-Schmidt process and we would come up with cosine and sine as being the um, uh, orthogonal, orthonormal uh, basis vectors for phase shift keying. And an example of that would be what we saw uh, previously in chapter three, which is the antipodal signaling or binary phase shift keying, because of course, uh, when we have positive, it's like phase zero, and we, when we have negative, it's like being uh, out of phase by uh, minus pi. And so um, this is uh, an example, and then again, these are typical uh, basis vectors for phase shift keying. So you'll notice that although this is general for any size m, no matter how many symbols I have, the signal space repre representation of phase shift keying is always two-dimensional. So let's do what we, uh, let's represent MPSK 
signaling in signal space. And I want to do it right now because I want you to get to a feeling, why do we bother with the signal space? What's it good for? So here is Spaceship King. And I know that by this definition here, if I looked for the energy of each one of these symbols, it's clear that each one of these symbols has exactly the same energy. Because if I do the integral squared of S, uh, the integral of s squared, I'm going to have the integral of cosine squared, and I'm going to get the same energy for all of them. Since all of the points have the same energy, that means they're all going to fall on a circle in the signal space, because the distance from the origin to the constellation point, that distance represents its energy, and all of them have the same energy. So because they have the same energy, they're all at the same distance. And I said that I would take, uh, typically I would take the two pi radians in a circle, divide by m, and these would become the separations between my symbols. So in this example, I have eight symbols. It's eight PSK, and we can see that there's 45 degrees um, separation between each of the points in the constellation. So this is a signal space representation for m PSK. So what is the impact of larger m? So here I have 8. What happens if I put in 16 PSK? Well, they're all at the same distance from the origin. So if I put them in more densely, that means they're going to be more closely packed because they're constrained to be on this circle because they all have the same energy. They're all going to fall in a circle. So the more of them I have, the tighter they are to each other. And when the tighter they are to each other, of course, the more likely I'm going to have errors. So right away, when I take this strategy for MPSK, I realize that larger M is going to lead to more bit errors. Okay, Well, that's something we get without doing any math, just geometrically. Uh, so it's very good to get an intuition for what goes on with different modulation formats. Now let's consider another kind of uh, modulation, and this is called frequency shift keying. Again, we have the um, equation here for the waveform, which is based on a cosine. And this time, this theta just represents some arbitrary unknown phase offset. But the information is now coded in the frequency, hence frequency shift keying. And now I have the index i to say there will be a different frequency for each one of the symbols that I want to transmit. And again, we assume that this uh, signal is zero except in the symbol uh, interval. So there are m distinct frequencies, one frequency for each of the symbols in the MRI uh, modulation. Again, in this equation, E represents the energy per symbol and T the symbol time. Now, this time when we go to uh, typical um, uh, basis vectors, remember basis vectors, even orthonormal basis vectors are not unique. This is an, an infinite choice, but a convenient choice would have each one of the um, symbols representing a basis vector. And we can take, without loss of generality, uh, the case where theta equals zero, because we're considering now coherent detection, uh, for instance, where this is known. And so if we take it to be zero, it's the same as being known. So there will be a collection of m of these. And we assume that for, fre for frequency shift keying, or the, the way that we choose our modulation frequencies, are such that they are uh, orthogonal to one another. And I'll be talking a lot more about that towards the end of the chapter, about what implication there is in the choice of frequencies. But right now, we'll just take it for granted that the frequencies are chosen so that their inner product is 0, so that they could be, they are indeed orthogonal. And by choosing them as cosines, they are orthogonal. Again, m typically in this case is chosen as a power of 2. Now what's interesting, uh, different from FSK and PSK, is that we can see now that the space, the signal space, is of dimension m. I have m symbols and I have m um, basis vectors. So the dimension of the signal space is 
uh, is capital M. So let's look now at for FSK, what does it look like when I choose a vector space? Uh, it's a little harder to visualize, so I'm going to take just three ARI, uh, three um, uh, tertiary FSK. So we have uh, three symbols in our constellation, and each one of those symbols is orthogonal to the other, so the basis vectors. Each one is represented really by a cube uh, because, as I mentioned, they all have the same energy. And since they all have the same energy, that means they're all at the same distance from the origin. Uh, each one falls on a basis vector, so here is along, S1 is along the basis vector C1. That ends up to be one corner of this cube. S2 gives you the other corner of this cube, S3 the third corner of the cube. So these three points describe a cube equally distant. So at higher dimensions, as we add symbols, we're adding dimensions, we're adding another vector, we're adding another basis vector, which means that we're defining another cube, but in M dimensional space. So we call that a hypercube of dimension M. So the number of frequencies is equal to the number of uh, points in the constellation. The dimension of the space is M. And now I ask you the question, what is the impact of larger M? Well, in this case, when I add another point, I'm adding another basis vector. And the distance to the origin is always the same for all of them. And if I ask what is the distance between each one of them, well, they're, they're like on the faces of a cube. And so the distance between S1 is a, and S2 is the same as the distance between S2 and S3 is the same as the distance between S1 and S3. And no matter how many more constellation points I add, this is always the case. So in this case, I could add constellation points and there would be absolutely uh, no difference in the distance between symbols, which I know means that when I add noise to them, there's going to be no difference in the bit error rate because the distance stays the same. So for a given level of noise, the errors would always happen at the same uh, frequency or the same uh, probability. Okay, so we've seen phase shift keying, frequency shift keying, and now we're going to see amplitude shift keying. And we often also hear that called a PAM, pulse amplitude modulation. And uh, in this case, what we're doing is we're putting it, uh, we, we saw baseband pulse amplitude modulation in uh, chapter three. And we could imagine that we could take the same idea of different amplitudes, but adding a carrier to this. So once again, here we have the cosine representing the carrier frequency. And now you see that the EIs, the energy varies with each one of the symbols. And indeed, it's the amplitude of the signal which carries the information. So this um, approach is lower performance than uh, some of the other modulation formats. And so it's, it's not used as frequently. Although uh, I can tell you that in optical communications, there's been a resurgence of interest in PAM just because the receivers can be very, very simple. And so although the performance is low, when we look for the, the trade-off, the cost can be quite low. And so it could be interesting uh, for that reason. Uh, you know, we d typically have discrete levels that are um, uh, discrete but also regularly spaced uh, in order to keep them uh, easy to, to manage. And one example would be on off keying, in which case one of the amplitudes would be zero, and then that would be logic zero, and there would be another amplitude for logic one. So I said that on off keying was one example of amplitude shift keying, but I could also say that BPSK, or excuse me, antipodal signaling, is also a an example of amplitude shift keying. It falls under this definition. In this case, it would be uh, plus and minus one would be the uh, uh, amplitudes which are used. And if I went from two to four, for instance, um, and now I'm using the energy, average energy per symbol, and they were regularly spaced, so amplitude uh, plus and minus one, amplitude plus and minus three, so that they're all equally spaced. So this is quite typical uh, for PAM, is to have equally 
symbols which are equally spaced. And uh, you know, you want to ask what happens as I uh, increase from uh, two to four. Uh, are my symbols being more closely packed? It sort of looks like it, except that I have to be careful because I should really be representing everything in the same um, format. And uh, so this is energy per symbol, and I really should put it in energy per bit so that I can fairly compare these two. And uh, there is this uh, log two of four is going to happen with the uh, energy per symbol as opposed to energy per bit. But let's go ahead and re-normalize re this signal space. So instead of being in terms of energy, average uh, symbol energy is in terms of an average bit energy. So here we can see So let's now look at the signal space representation for amplitude shift keying. I mentioned that on-off keying was an example of amplitude shift keying, but I could equally say that the antipodal signaling is also an example of amplitude shift keying. So I could have plus and minus one, for instance, as the two amplitudes that represent a logical zero and a logical one. Okay, that's also amplitude shift keying. And what happens when I go from two symbols to let's say four symbols. So when I go to four symbols, uh, here I can say that uh, you can see that I have equally spaced symbols, so that's quite common. So if I have plus and minus one, I'll get plus and minus three, so that the difference between adjacent symbols, they're all always at the uh, same distance. Uh, but you will note that the symbols are not all at the same distance from the origin. So when I have four here, these two are closer to the origin than the other ones, which means that all of the symbols do not have the same energy because they're not at the same distance from the origin. And you can ask, what would be the impact of larger m? And I'm looking now at this plot and I think, oh, it looks like they're closer together, but that's not quite fair because if I want to be able to use signal space effectively, it's extremely important that I always have the correct normalization. And the correct normalization is to put everything in the same units, either the same energy per bit or energy per symbol. So this might, uh, so in this case, if I really want to compare the two, let me compare them in terms of energy per bit. Uh, there's not a big difference uh, because the energy per symbol would just be uh, two times the energy per bit in this case. And it really, you're getting the same conclusion, but I just want to make sure that uh, you take the habit of making sure when you compare that they're in the same units. So one thing I want to observe is that as we get m larger, they are all going on the line. So it's a one-dimensional space, no matter the number of symbols. And indeed, as the number m gets larger, we are spacing them uh, more closely. So um, PSK, ASK, as the modulation number increases, the bit error rate will go up. But for FSK, uh, it'll be the same, unaffected by the modulation order. So there's a final um, uh, type of modulation, which is called amplitude phase keying, or much more common, quadrature amplitude modulation. And this is introduced briefly in Chapter 4, but in the textbook, it's really covered a lot in Chapter 9. So uh, quadrature amplitude modulation, what is this? Well, this is a combination of two of the previous ones. So we had um, phase and amplitude, which can be manipulated independently uh, in order to um, create this modulation of format. And uh, we'll be talking a lot more about this later, but I just want to give you the definition now. And uh, again, there's these um, typically discrete levels so just like we saw plus and minus one, plus and minus three, uh, the plus and minus five as being the levels for amplitude shift keying, this is typically what we do for quadrature amplitude modulation, but there'll be a lot more variation in this QAM uh, modulation perhaps than others, but typically discrete levels. Uh, we'll find that one of the main reasons that we turn to QAM modulation is because of bandwidth efficiency. It's extremely bandwidth efficient.
And I'll remark on that now, just saying that there is, again, a two-dimensional space because we have a cosine here, and it's the phase that changes. And so uh, the sine and cosine become um, uh, basis vectors, which span the space of all possibilities that are covered here. And so it is a two-dimensional space, uh, no matter the number of symbols that you have. And that contributes to the bandwidth efficiency. But we'll be talking about that a little more later in the chapter. Uh, I want to also bring your attention to the fact that the energies are unequal, just like they were in PAM modulation. All symbols are not at the same distance from the origin. And because of this, uh, the energies are unequal. And we can see that here because of uh, this uh, index on the EI, that it varies depending on where we are. So this would be the uh, typical QAM modulation. For instance, if I have uh, four symbols, uh, that would become the square modulation, these four. So this would be a typical QAM modulation. In this case, um, 4 is highlighted. The innermost would be QAM4, which is the same as uh, QPSK, also the sort of overlap in definitions. But let's go and suppose we went up to 8. This would be sort of a rectangular geometry. We go to 16. Uh, we have a square geometry again. And so you can see that these are sort of like plus and minus 1, plus and minus 3. Then I'll go to plus and minus 5, plus and minus 7, etc. So there's always sort of the same distance that I'm increasing. And I can go to 32, so all of these points interior here, or I could go to uh, 64. So this would be a typical rectangular uh, QAM, but we'll see other geometries when we look at QAM more closely. So I've introduced to you now uh, these different modulation formats. And of course, we've done the binary already, but we have to cover the MRE. Uh, analysis. And then we're going to have the choice, do we assume that we know the phase and we're doing coherent detection, or is the phase unknown and we're doing non-coherent detection? And depending on uh, whether or not we assume that the phase is known, we're going to get a different type of receiver and we're going to get different performance. So we have to do the analysis for these. So different modulations, different scenarios that we'll be looking at. Uh, so the Binary coherent detection uh, was already calculated using signal space analysis in uh, chapter uh, three. Uh, but let's uh, come back then and look at what a coherent detection would typically look like. Um, we would, um, there were two modulation formats that could use coherent detection, um, PSK, FSK, I could add QAM here. I should also have added that. It's not just two, there's many. Uh, the form of the receiver for the binary case, we already saw it was a correlator. So you have the received signal come in. You correlate it with, you could correlate with one or the other. For binary, it's easy. You correlate it with the difference between the two. Um, that's multiplying and then integration. And that gives you your test statistic. And then your decision stage is to compare that with a threshold. So this was coherent detection for the binary case. And um, now we're going to go to the MRE and the coherent detection. And we're going to find that we can calculate or approximate the error probability using something called the union bound. So this is the direction we're heading in for the rest of the chapter. Finally, uh, we'll uh, at the very end of the chapter, we'll cover very quickly non-coherent detection. We'll spend most of our time on uh, the coherent detection, doing a lot of development, and then um, the non-coherent, uh, we'll do less derivation and just uh, uh, look at the results.